Welcome to this uh, DEF CON session about the UiPath apps and how I built a custom orchestrator dashboard in no time using UiPath apps. Um, I will first go through a small presentation, set the groundwork, so to speak, a little bit, and then try and jump directly into a demo uh, and show you how it's actually done. Just real quick, um, something about myself and who I am as a presenter. So my name is Frank Shikora. I'm the global head of delivery for Ruburio, and I'm a returning 2021 MVP. Um, and I'm super excited to be here. I'm super excited to um, have the opportunity to present this, present this to you because in the end, I feel like apps is a super, super capable platform. Um, and I feel like there's a lot that can be done with it. So let's just quickly jump in to the end-to-end -end automation process. And we all know this one, right? Where we have the different phases. And I feel like um, this is something that I will be going over in the next slide, um, where apps can actually be put in. And normally, it is pushed in, put into the engage category. But I feel like there is a lot more that can be done with apps. And for this, uh, what I will be showcasing with the orchestrator dashboard, right? We are um, going a little bit more into the manage and the run category, because in the end, we are managing of um, if our robots are online, um, which robots are online, and then also what we can do in the deploy part. This would be something that is later on then um, in the further development of the app. It could be that um, packages are created, packages are deployed directly out of an app that you can then use um, overall your different instances of the orchestrator. So if we go a little bit deeper into that in the end, then the human robot engagement spectrum, um, what I wanted to highlight here is in the end, apps can be used in almost every facet of the game, so to speak, right? So we have an attended robot with an interval where the human is involved, the robot at a defined interval. This can be beautifully done via apps, right? So the apps can integrate with the tasks. The apps could integrate as an attended bot in this case, right? With a form or um, whatever you have there. So this is something apps can be used for. Then attended in tandem where the human on the computer works with the robot process in the background, which is basically something we are doing now with the orchestrator dashboard, right? Where I as a human work with the dashboard. And then in the end, in the background, the robot is processing data and getting data ready for the dashboard. Then obviously we have the hybrid deployment, right? Where the human enters inputs, business inputs, um, be it of either over an attended robot or the web interface. And this triggers an unattended process in the background. This can be beautifully done via apps and then the partially unattended part where the human basically sets the stage and let it run. This is also something, a file upload that can be done within an app, for example. So as you see, the apps really, really give a lot of functionality and can be used in a lot of um, contexts. Um, within the, the automation space. And I feel this is really where the strong suit of apps lies. There's basically limitless possibilities, if we want to say so. So just real quick, unattended or unattended, in case of apps, really, it doesn't matter. There are unattended use cases, as we see here, right? An app could run on a mobile device, right? Um, and then there's a fire and forget part where basically the human triggers um, a process and this process is then launched in the background. And basically the app, is needed only for the, um, yeah, the fire and forget part. Uh, in my case, I'm using it for data retrieval. And this is something that we see then in the attended unattended space, right? Where a process can basically aggregate data across multiple systems, display them and orchestrate the execution of multiple attended and unattended processes, right? This is basically what the dashboard in the end does then for us. It creates an aggregation of data and gives it back to us and displays it. And this is something where it really jives well together. And then also there's a, the attended space where the app basically is used to facilitate and help the, um, the user to be able to navigate different systems or process or um, start process that need execution. So all in all, attended or unattended doesn't matter in the context of apps. Apps are always useful and apps can always be used. For the next part, to get going in seconds, I just want to highlight one thing here. UiPath is providing app templates that get you started, and those are great templates. We will look at those when I go into the demo. And the second part is learn the UI, UI and UX best practices. There's a UiPath best practice guide on that to make your apps look good, because this is the other part of the equation, right? The apps need to function well, but they also should look right. And this the UX guide is really something that is helping a lot in, in this case. Exactly. And now, really, like I said, a short, um, quick introduction in the demo. What we'll be showing in this demo. 
I want to show you how to start from a template and how to make your own mind about how it should look, how to use expressions, how to use data services to store relevant information and use those information that you stored in the data services within a workflow. And then also how to leverage unattended robot for the apps that you have created and then go over some best practices um, that you should adhere to when building apps. And then without further ado, let's jump into the demo. All right, so first things first, Let's take a look here at uh, into the sample layouts that are provided by UiPath. In the end, what we see here when we go to docs.uipath.com into the apps section that we have some sample layouts here, right? Like the sample dashboard layout, which is one sample that I have used um, to create actually the app that I will be showing here. Um, you can just download it here. It's a UI app file, and this is something that you can just use then and import into your um, into your apps and start creating from there, right? So when you create a new app, you can just import this one and you will have it ready-made. For the other part that I wanted to talk about, which is the UI and UX guide, right? This is now shown here where we have separate design layouts. So you see it's 35 pages in the end that really help you um, understand how to create um, good UIs, good UX with best practices on how to really go through everything. I can only recommend this document um, a lot. This is um, published directly by your iPad and it really helps you get going also in terms of how do I start with this story, which is something that is important about the app, right? What is needed in the app? How should it look? What functionality should it provide? Right. So there's a lot in there also outside of just the, I would say, the normal UI and UX best practices that you have. There's um, yeah, a lot of reference material to really help you get started with your apps. All right. So now if we switch over to um, the studio app, so this is actually the sample layout that I've been using where um, yeah, in the end, I had the idea of, I want to show three orchestrators, right? So you see here, I have three separate um, yeah, separate columns in the end, right? I have some other content where I want to display then the offline robots. Um, and this is then really what I used. And I went from there to build out the app itself, right? We have some other informations here. Um, then in the end, like in the top, with the more content, this is then something that I put on another page. We have the total of two processes running, which I then use to display the number of offline robots across all my orchestrators, right? So this is something where you can really start from a template and it already gives you um, a, basically a good layout to be able to understand um, how you should structure your app and where to go with it. All right, so if we jump a little bit more into the layout, you see you already have different containers. Um, you've already different layouts, which help you also to understand how to actually structure something like a container, right? So in the beginning, in the main page, if you really want to take a look at what is happening, if you click on the, um, the little arrow here, right, it basically directly takes you also to uh, the rules for that page. Um, in this case, because expressions are enabled, we have an, an error here at the moment because this is um, how the colors are displayed here at the moment. And if we jump now over to see how the actual app looks like, um, we see here within my um, app, I have created a container with an index, which is basically um, a second um, part of the, um, of the container. And then also I created, created additional pages. So this is one thing about the best practices right, which we see here, the sample layout top menu bar in the end, which uh, um, then we see here at the top as a navigational part, which is really a best practice to have this on all of your pages. And this is where the page container comes in, which I renamed here to index, which helps you display the navigation on each of the um, separate um, sites and containers that you have created. In the end, if we now uh, jump to the separate buttons that we see here, Right, um, and then we go to the main page in the end, which references it. And how do we do that? Within the page container, right? So within that page container, you can make sure which page is then actually displayed, right? So we see here in the page container was the main page, and now we jump to the main page directly and load that one in. 
Um, now we see here, we have our three separate columns for each of the orchestrators and each one has a status in the end, right? I said a status and an SSL status, which I um, verify then through the use of a robot. And I have an expression here. And this is the part where I want to jump a little bit into the expressions. You also see here a total number of offline robots with then separate expressions and the offline robot list. So this is the part, the first start of the, um, of the actual app than here in this case. So let me jump to the table itself, right? Because one thing I wanted to show or highlight here is as a data source, I have here um, a data table in the end. And this data table is an output argument of the process that um, I have then created to um, yeah, make in the end the, um, the processing of those um, parts possible. And then if we jump back to the um, expressions in the name, right? Because I have separate orchestrators and I don't want to, this to be in the same column again. We have an out name here, which is then if something is there as an output, um, which is then the name or orchestrator one, two, and three F we've seen here now. In the end, if we now jump over to the total number of offline robots, um, there's something that I wanted to show with the expressions. And this is something that is now more easy than ever before. In the end, before, you, if you want to show or hide something, you really had to use rules for that. Now you can really do this directly within the expressions. So what we see here, the text is my out argument as out offline robots, right? And if we want to see that hidden, so basically I only want to show this is the number of offline robots is zero. So if it's greater than zero, then I say out offline number robots greater zero equals null, then I jump back to the other one. This is a little bit finicky at the moment, right? So, and if we see here, if the number of offline robots equals zero, then I will hide this one. So if we have um, yeah, basically one offline robot, then I want to display this in red here, right? And this is how I did it um, in this case with an expression. Now I have a second part down here with a divider separated and a custom list where I want to display actually then the online robots. Right, so I have another data source, the out overall robots, which is another data table, which basically contains all the online robots with the name, the status, the license, and the orchestrator they are adhering to. Right, and basically I did the same thing here. I have a container and a name for the label and the label itself, and the label itself. So the expression here is again tied to that um, to the data table, and then to uh, a column in that data table. And the cool thing about this custom list really is that um, this is dynamic, absolute, uh, absolutely dynamic in this case, and will display all the online robots that I have. And we see here, I have separate processes for this, right? And each of those processes supplies different arguments in there. So one thing that we see here is th those are not all the output arguments that we have because with the show best matches, this is something that is new. Um, apps basically tries to um, figure out what is the best um, for you in this case, if I untap, uh, unclick this, right, we see there are more output arguments here that can be used within the context of your app. Also, this is something important to keep in mind. If you don't see it directly, <clears throat> then just make sure to um, unclick the show best matches option, right? So everything that is here can be used um, within an expression or just as a value within your process, right? And this is an output of a robot process within your iPath. Right, and this is then basically used to feed all my my dashboarding here um, within within the app. Um, exactly, and then if we take a look back at to to the additional pages, so we have additional orchestrators and an add orchestrator page. If we go to the additional orchestrator page, so what I did here also is use a custom list in the end to add all additional orchestrators beyond the first three that I'm storing within the data services. Um, we will take a look at the data services a little bit later on, but this again helps you just to create a dynamic list with a lot of content. I added also a return button here, um, which is then basically a little bit superfluous in, in case of we also have the index here, but it's good to always be sure how to return then in the end, right? Then if we take a look at the ad orchestrator, what I did here, uh, this looks a little bit funny because in the end, what I did here is I created um, a dropdown, which is basically then filled by a list. In this list, we have either a true, uh, not a true, sorry, um, an on-prem or a cloud, 
right? And depending on that, the on-prem or the cloud attributes are displayed. And this is another cool use of the expression. So if we take a look at the on-prem here, right? In the end, I see an if here, right? So if my org type, which is a variable that I bind in the type itself. So if this equals on-prem, then this is basically not hidden, otherwise it is hidden. And the same part is then true for the cloud. I will show that a little bit later on. So in this case, right? So here with the type, I'm binding this for one as an input argument for my, uh, for my process. And then also I have a value binding here that is basically telling me what type of, um, what type of orchestrator I want to add. And depending on that, a different input um, is displayed. So this is a, it for a quick overview over the, over the app, right? And this is also why this looks a little bit um, different. This looks better. Let's take a look at the app itself. Please, right? So in this case, right, you see here, when we take a look at what we want to do when we um, visit the main page, in this case, we start the orchestrator um, or the process with the dashboard test. We show a spinner that is visible um, as long as the process is running and then is made invisible when the process is completed and it's done in unattended mode, which is important in this case, right? So this is triggered not when we open the index page, but when we open the main page, right? The index page, but then triggers the main page. So this is something that we see here. And then also the index page is at the moment set as a starting page, um, which you can do here as a right click as I just showed in the, um, in the menu. Now let's start the app. The app is now starting and the um, main page will be loaded. With that, um, the process is basically running now in the background. Um, we see the spinner. Now we switch over to the orchestrator directly, right? Where we see the job is running. Um, it's an unattended job, right? And now the job is finished and we see the dashboard is filled. We have nine offline robots. So if we count the offline robots list, this is also there, directly there. We see all our, off all our offline robots with the robot count and with the run times. We see the different names for the orchestrators. We see the status for the orchestrator itself and for the SSL certificate. And we see that there's also some online robots within those orchestrators, right? And this list, like I said, is dynamic. So if there were five, 10, or however many robots, those would still be displayed with the name, with the status, which is then basically if it's online or not, and if the, uh, the number of licenses that are consumed by um, that online robot at the moment, exactly. And this is then basically the part um, where we say, so this could also be dynamic if we take a look now at the additional orchestrators that are within the data service. So we see we have a cloud org dev here. This is the fourth orchestrator basically. This one is operational uh, in terms of the status and the SSL and has no offline robots, right? So if we jump back now to the home button, one thing that is happening is um, because we scan configured it that way, the process is running again and basically updates the dashboard again. Right, this is something that is important in terms of a dashboard because we always want to make sure that it's up to date. The other part that you could do here um, is basically create a button that only um, refreshes this on demand, right? Depending on the runtime of the processes, obviously. Now, if we want to add another orchestrator in, now we see here the drop down. So if we figure it on on prem, right, it changes the fields that are needed and cloud. Um, depending on what is needed for the separate orchestrators. So I will just put in here a new orchestrator. Um, don't pay attention to the password. The password is not super safe, but also um, this is something that will be changed afterwards. So I need a password, a user, right? I need a service URL, which I um, saved back here. In the end, um, this is just the URL of the orchestrator. Then I need a tenant because we are on-prem, right? The old data query is just something that I put in um, just for simplicity's sake. This is also something that you could do within your code, right? And then also the display name that we see that when we then um, check in the additional orchestrators again, that basically this is also added to the database and is also queried again, right? So now if we click submit, it is starting the other process that we've um, that I have set up, right? So we switch over to the process again. We saw, so now see here the add orchestrator part is running. And then if we switch back to our orchestrator, it just takes a little bit um, to actually finish the process. And then a pop-up will be displayed that the orchestrator was added to the database as a successful message, right? And obviously then again, as we are returning to the main page, um, the update is running again, but this is also the needed because we added a new orchestrator here, right? So if we jump over now to the additional orchestrators, 
we see here the DEFCON org is in the status for the um, tenant itself or for the orchestrator itself is operational, the SSL is operational, but we also have an offline robot here. And obviously we could do a lot more than here in terms of alerting and so on. No? And now if we just want to um, jump back to the, to the main page again, to just go um, into the rest of um, the demo here, right? We're still waiting a little bit on the orchestrator itself. Um, and basically, that would be it about the um, the app that I built, right? Uh, like I said, there's obviously a lot of um, a lot of points um, that can be improved and that will be improved, so to speak, uh, in the future in terms of um, more functionality. But I just wanted to give a quick overview of how to actually do this. Now, if we jump to how I'm actually doing this, this is in the data services. What I created here is an orchestrators entity. And within that orchestrators entity, I'm saving all the separate information that is needed to actually make the queries within my code, right? So we have something like the type for cloud or on-prem. We have a tenant, a client ID, and the refresh token in terms of if we have a cloud orchestrator, password, and user, and the tenant, like I said, if we are an on-prem orchestrator. Right? So and all this is safe within an entity to make it really dynamic in terms of what we can achieve with this app. Right. So the more you add in, the more will be displayed and will be used within the orchestrator. Right. And in the end, it doesn't matter which one is the first orchestrator in the in the entity. Right. Or which one is the second. This is then here the part where this is basically um, linked directly. So I have three data tables that are coming out or three um, fixed data tables that are coming out of the code. Um, which are then displayed on this first page here. And then everything else, like I mentioned, is then displayed on, on the other page. I want to quickly go now over the process that I use. Right, so I have two processes here. One is the dashboard test. The other one is the um, add orchestrator part. And one thing I wanted to highlight here is then um, basically if you want to take a look at what is within those processes, Right, then one thing is important, always let them run beforehand, then refresh, and then in the results, you see everything that is there in terms of um, output or input data, right? So parameters is then with the uh, input parameters and results are the output parameters, right? So we see with the add orchestrator, at the moment, I don't have an output, but if I then take a look at the parameters, meters in this case, right? So there are no input parameters for the dashboard test. And then I see all the other input parameters that I have for my ad orchestrator test. And like I said, one thing that I wanted to highlight here is always let the process run one time before you want to see something here, because otherwise it will not run. This can be done within the processes here in the cloud, or then also directly in the, in the orchestrator itself, right? Um, and this is something that you always need to check in the end. All right, if we now jump back to the main page, just to get a last look at it. And now I just quickly wanted to um, take a look at what actually contains the code or how I, I um, in the end, structured the code then within your iPath. So if we see, and this is something I want to um, preface, um, I have two separate um, workflows here, right? And both can be used as an entry point. This is the um, interesting part here, right? So I have not two separate um, processes really, I have just two separate workflows and both of them can be used as an entry point. So I don't need to divide the jobs out um, in this case, right? So, um, and in the end, this is something that you can do and is an interesting um, new mechanic, so to speak, to be able to use the same process for um, the whole querying. So if we take a look into the entities then, right? So for manage entities, you see here, we have the orchestrators with the separate fields. And this is just used now to really import the, um, the orchestrator entities into the workflow, right? And then use those orchestrator entities to really um, build a data table in this case, right? For my out orchestrators in the end. So for the overall robots, so these are the, the online robots. And I'm iterating through all of the orchestrators that are within my database. So for the first three, um, as they those are basically set for the first page, right? I'm using it for each and I'm using a switch to then basically um, have a, because like I said, I need a fixed output in this case, this cannot be um, done dynamically. And um, I use just a switch case to iterate through the first three. One thing that I wanted to highlight here, um, I, this should be in a workflow, this is not separated out, but um, for the sake of showing it, um, this is just easier in terms of the authentication. So I have two here. 
the cloud authentication, the on-prem authentication, and then again, the unattended robots that I get are separated between cloud and the on-prem unattended robots. So this is something that is important that cloud and on-prem are just used differently. Then I'm building a data table, right? Depending on, um, on what I get back from the, um, from the um, HTTP request, so from the REST API call. And this is then something where I'm building the data table for the offline parts. Um, I'm iterating them through all of the machines I get back from the API call. And basically, if those are offline, I add them in to, um, that, uh, to the data table and also then um, just add up the number of offline robots then in the end to make sure that, um, yeah, to make sure that I get a complete overview over all the offline robots that are within that. The next part is then the status check, right? So in this case, um, it can be used the same because the status check basically is the same for cloud and for on-prem. Um, then again, I see if I can get back the can connect or there has bad SSL. And basically if everything is good, then I put an operational in. If not, I put an error in or an SSL set error. And then I also get the orchestrator name as an output argument from the entity that I have provided. And in the end, again, this is, should be separated out in workflows, but for the sake of the demo, it is easier to show it when I just have it here directly within the workflow. Um, then I'm iterating through the cases zero, one, and two. So basically the first three orchestrators and everything after that, right? So we have here a, a data table again with the out other um, orchestrators in the end. Um, I'm basically skipping the first three and then iterating through whatever else I have left um, in the entities, right? So I'm basically doing the same thing. I'm authenticating, I'm getting the status check, and then I get the unattended robots again. This is then done for all of those additional um, parts. I'm using the data table. And if we take a look at the uh, machine data, uh, the output arguments in the machine data, right? I basically have three fixed um, outputs for the three basic, for the three um, first orchestrators. And everything after that is then basically um, fixed within a dynamic data table, which I'm giving back then to um, to the app itself, right? This is the second part with the custom list that we take, uh, took a look at at the additional uh, orchestrators page, right? So, and this is one thing that I just wanted to mention, how you can structure a different database. In the end, if we add the orchestrator, this is also something where I'm using the entities, right? So basically I'm using a multiple assign here and creating a new um, instance of an, of an orchestrator and then basically give back everything um, that I'm getting as an as an input from the app itself, right? And with that, I'm creating the the input record, so to speak, right? And this is then used with the um, with the create entity record as the next part to then add this to um, the database in the end, right? And this is this is everything. This is a simple workflow, but it adds the additional orchestrator then to the database, and with that, um, I'm able to dynamically go through all of these, right? Um, and iterate through those. And that's basically um, everything that is at the moment within this workflow. All right, uh, and that's basically it for the workflow itself. So if we then just quickly jump back into um, the app, I just want to make one or two points or where to re-emphasize these, these points, right? So this again is the main page, which is then bound directly. And then if we take a look at the processes again, this is the, again, a hugely important part. Let the processes run at least one time before you actually um, try to receive anything in terms of results or in terms of parameters that you want to bind. And this is also something that is super important. Um, if you add something in, um, so an output parameter or delete something out as an input parameter, always make sure that you publish the right version, use the right version, right? Because in the end, if you're replacing a process, then this is something I always want to, or also want to emphasize in terms of a best practice. Replacing a process can be done, but you need to be mindful of a few things in the end. So I can only um, urge you to read through this reference page, right? Because once a process is replaced, it cannot be undone. And if you remove an argument, right, this leads to invalid bindings. So in the end, um, if you look at something, if you just delete something out, this might have serious consequences. So always be mindful. And this is something where we go through the customer journey, right? Be aware of what you actually want to do within your main page, within your index page, right? Where you need all the separate bindings to be able to um, don't, so that you don't actually need to replace 
um, anything in terms of the arguments, right? Then also, if we jump back to the index page here in the end, um, navigation is always something that is super important to have on, on your top menu screen. So again, start with the templates, take a look at the templates, take a look at your I and UX record and really go through the documentation that is there. Um, and that would basically be everything from my side. Thank you so much for your attention. And I hope um, I could give you some ideas of how to structure this in the future and how to get started with apps.